Funding for this program made possible by Paducah McCracken Joint Sewer Agency, Paducah Water, Bluegrass Green Source. Hello everyone, and welcome to No More, the educational television series that takes a look at what life would be like without nonprofit services in our communities. Thanks for tuning in to part two of our episode on nonprofits working with water. It may be hard to imagine today, but as one of the first colonial settlements west of the Appalachian Mountains, Boonesboro, was a happening and important place between 1775 and 1780. In fact, one of the first meetings on the Western frontier took place right around here, beneath a stand of giant sycamores, when members of the first colonial land companies assembled to petition the British colony of Virginia for statehood on the other side of the Commonwealth. Paducah's River Discovery Center aims to ensure that its river history does not wash away. The center celebrates the natural and historical lives of the four major rivers that converge near it. How do you move a ton of cargo over 600 miles on one gallon of fuel? Let's find out. Which uh, place has more freight tonnage annually, the Panama Canal or Paducah, Kentucky. It's Paducah, Kentucky by a long shot, as a matter of fact. We are actually at the nexus of the busiest and most important concentration of navigable waterways in the world. Well, Paducah exists because it's on a river, and uh, a lot of visionaries in our community felt that there was a real need for a river museum to highlight Paducah's rich river heritage, as well as our river industry that is so important for this community. The reason we are here is because we want to educate about our rivers and all of our inland waterways. Um, Paducah is uh, at the confluence of the Ohio and Tennessee rivers and not far from the Mississippi and Cumberland rivers. So it's just so important for both adults and children uh, to learn about the impact of our rivers and how important they are to our existence and, and in our daily lives. Well, really we touch on almost every single aspect of the river. We spend time going through the interactive exhibits. We spend time in the navigation simulator, which is one of their favorite activities. It's like a big video game. And we also spend time in the classroom. Uh, we take a lot of things from the river. Um, we, of course, here in Paducah, get our drinking water from the Tennessee River. It's important to teach children that they can have fun on the river. Transportation of cargo, of course, is very important for them to learn about. And it's very, very important for them to learn about the life that lives within the river, as well as the life uh, in the riparian environment, the animals that live on the land and in the air. They need to be connected to where they're growing up. They need to understand the role of the rivers, um, the history, the flood of 1937 was the most devastating flood in recorded history in Paducah. 20,000 uh, residents of Paducah had to be relocated during this flood. People were not prepared. The day that the river got its deepest, it was rising at a rate of one foot per hour. So it trapped people in their homes. Uh, the flood in Paducah stretched out 28 blocks all the way out to 28th Street and uh, they said in places the Ohio River was 10 miles wide. It was a very uh, devastating event for Paducah. So the Army Corps of Engineers went to work to prevent this kind of devastation 
uh, happening again, and uh, flood walls were built in all the cities along the Ohio River that had been affected by the flood. The Paducah flood wall was completed in 1944, and um, it's, it's been in place ever since. We have lots of steamboats that stop here. They're very important to the business of our River Discovery Center, and we love our uh, visits from the, the Queens. Uh, they're from all over the world. They just bring such a wonderful flavor to our community, and I think they enjoy coming and learning more about the heritage of steamboating. Many of our passengers love the Mississippi River system. Uh, a lot of them, especially this week that we're on right now, have sailed on the whole Mississippi River system year after year. We are aboard the Queen of the Mississippi. And she sails the whole Mississippi River system all the way up to St. Paul, Minnesota, as well as a little bit to the east on the Ohio River to Cincinnati, Ohio, down to St. Louis, Memphis, and of course, down to New Orleans. Our vessels with American Cruise Lines are all smaller vessels. They're not these 3,000 passenger cruise ships. Therefore, we're able to get into these small towns and offer unique tours. Our passengers love coming to these small towns, like I said, in the heartland of America. Uh, they love Paducah, Kentucky, so our passengers are able to experience small town USA, and they love that. They can learn really everything about uh, river commerce, the history of our rivers, how, how important um, the industry is to this region. We've got a great deal of support from our community, uh, from the river industry. They, they know how important we are, and uh, we, we exist because of that support. Our students who come in are absolutely uh, exposed to a possible future of working on the river. Uh, we often have members of towboats who come in and speak with the children. Uh, we talk to them about what it's like to be a member of a towboat crew. It's very important that our young people are exposed to the towboat industry, the importance of it to our nation's economy. When uh, people ask me, uh, they say, oh, are they, they still doing that out there? And I said, uh, yeah, very much so. You do this 24 hours a day? And I, we say, of course we do, because our economy depends upon it. Our way of life depends upon it. And we, we stand on the bank of the river, and we say, oh, it's just, well, that's just a towboat. And then I say, do you know how big that towboat is? I said, did you know that a standard tow on the Ohio River is, is considerably larger in surface area and in length than a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier. Yeah, I think uh, sometimes it, it is overlooked as it is the cheapest form of transportation for bulk commodity. Well, when you look at, when you take a snapshot of Ingram Barges Company, we'll load, on average, 115 barges a day. And this is just Ingram Barge Company. Barge unloading, loading facilities. You gotta have repair and maintenance facilities. You gotta have fueling facilities. I don't know what the number would be in reference to how many people are associated with keeping boats and barges moving up the river, but it's huge. We're at the Siemens Church Institute Center for Maritime Education in Paducah, Kentucky. Actually, we're in what this is called the control room. And uh, basically what we do is observe the mariners as they train in our simulators, which is in another part of the building. We can monitor their actions and reactions to the situations that are put before them. The Siemens Church Institute began in uh, the early to mid 1800s. They built a church on a barge, sent it out into the New York Harbor as the sailors would come in, and they would offer them a safe haven. The simulator helps us to be able to go in and run a, or build a situation. Maybe a company has a particular problem that they want to enhance on, they want to get their mariners aware of. We have a 260 degree visual front, side, and rear, and we can make it pretty re realistic. The nice thing about doing it here is we can stop anytime we want to and regroup. We can stop at a particular moment, go in the classroom, discuss what's going on, and go back in the simulator and then start back up again in the same spot. In the real world, you can't do drills like that. You're underway, you can't just stop at any given moment and say, okay, we're gonna have a drill. It doesn't cost anything to run into each other here. If the River Discovery Center did not exist, there really wouldn't be a place for our community, both children and adults, as well as all the visitors that come from outside of Paducah, 
to learn about our river and how important it is and all about its rich heritage. I think it'd be unfortunate to be lost. Um, you know, I know the work they, they do over there. I've, I've had the pleasure of participating with, with some work with children over there before. Ingram is heavily involved with, with uh, that piece of business because, uh, you know, I think it's kind of a hidden treasure. Uh, the earlier you educate people about uh, what the river does for, for communities all up and down the river, what it can do for individuals, what it can do for career opportunities, to spark that interest, the better off everybody is. And I hope they continue to do it in the future. it's so important for all of us to know where we came from. And it's really important for children, especially, to know about the heritage of the community that they came from, but also present day, uh, how vitally important our rivers are to us. The Mississippi River System and its tributaries have been the main artery of commerce for, for years, for generations. It's vitally important that our children in this community and in this region know about the heritage of our rivers, how important our rivers are to us, and we want to continue educating about that. Uh, one study showed that uh, uh, if, if uh, your, the grains had to be carried only by truck, uh, a box of Cheerios would run about $75, you know, like caviar. But I think it's about time that uh, we thank the members of the U.S. Merchant Marine, i.e. those river rats, the, the river mariners. We are all dependent upon uh, your, uh, your labors, your sacrifice, and those of your family who uh, make it possible for us to have uh, uh, pavement uh, and, and gasoline in our vehicles um, and a box of Cheerios that doesn't cost $75. I'm with Cheryl Norton from Kentucky American Water. So Cheryl, I think you would be the right person for me to ask this question. How does the water get into the sink in my home? Brian, I'm so glad you asked that question. Most people don't really understand how complicated it is to get water from the river and have it clean and safe delivered at your home when you turn the tap on every day. And so basically we take water from the river and there's a lot of sediment and silt in the river and so we have to add some chemicals to help settle out that sediment and silt from the water. So we do some chemical processes, we also do some physical processes. After we add the chemicals and the dirt starts to fall out of the water, then we run it through a couple of processes including filtration. So we try to filter as much of that out as we possibly can. After we've filtered out all of the, the dirt um, from the water so that it's nice, clean, and clear. We add a little bit of disinfectant to that water to make sure that it keeps the bacteria from growing as it comes to your house. And so when you turn on your tap, you get clean, clear, safe water. And you know, that's, that's the cleaning process of it. And in order for it to get from our treatment plant all the way to your home, it travels through many miles of Maine. Just in the Lexington area alone, we have um, nearly 2,000 miles of water main that runs under the ground that people never see or wow. think about. Wow. We have many pumps and things that have a very certain um, amount of time that they will last and so we have to continually be looking to replace those water mains and those pumps and pipes in order for to make sure that you consistently get water at your house. If a pipe breaks then then that interrupts the service to your home and we don't want that to happen and so we try to do everything we can to make that as rare as possible. Wow, you've really given me an education and I know we all appreciate that because now we know that you're on the job in taking care of us and making sure that water comes into our home. Thank you, Cheryl, for speaking with us and enjoy the day, wish you are. Thank you, Brian. Well, as you might guess, the Kentucky River is an inspiring and truly diverse body of water. Our next nonprofit, the Kentucky Riverkeeper, works with citizen coalitions to restore celebrate and utilize the Kentucky River Corridor. From educating to advocating, researching to pleasure paddling, this group is all things Kentucky River.
the Kentucky Riverkeeper was started about the year 2000. The Riverkeeper is part of a larger international organization that was founded by Robert Kennedy Jr. called the Waterkeeper Alliance. That was founded on the notion that every body of water needed to have a voice. We all care about water. There are all kinds of organizations that are about water in general, but how do you make it specific for um, a place? Our focus is the Kentucky River and the tributaries, the watershed. We started with the idea of uh, how do you connect 250 miles of, of communities that don't have anything in common except the river. In the past, they've, ha they, they've had this river going through their, their, their counties, but uh, have not utilized that. We're in urban Kentucky. Uh, the river runs through the middle of Estill County. Uh, and most, most of the times, the Kentucky River is the boundary of a county, but in our case, it runs through the middle of our county. We have 40 miles of the Kentucky River here in Estill County, and so we are very proud of that with the scenic view all up and down the river from one end to the other. Here at Irvin, I grew up uh, in this county and uh, grew up loving the river because my father used to take me fishing on the river and uh, uh, we would fish for bass and, and catfish and we ate a lot of food from the river. A little bit further. That's good. A lot of current. This is um, between lock and dam 11 and lock and dam 12. And there's 14 total. So we're close to the end. One of the longest pools of the river system. Those are the old lock houses that the lock masters used to utilize back in the day. Uh, of course, they created the, the locks and dams uh, for commerce. Uh, started back in the 1800s, finished up in the early 1900s. So most of these uh, dams themselves uh, are still some of the original material. Uh, it, they're basically wooden cribs that rocks were put inside to create the dams and then uh, concrete on the outside. And so just think, those things have been there over a hundred years. Uh, simply amazing that something was built that long ago that had the ability, uh, engineered, constructed, uh, had the ability to withstand all of the floods and all of the things that's happened through time. If it wasn't for the dams, uh, we'd be walking right now in the water. We wouldn't be in a boat. Uh, the Kentucky River Keepers has been a valuable asset for being a, a tremendous PR for the Kentucky River. Several things they try to do. One, we're trying to promote the Kentucky River, a forgotten uh, natural uh, habitat that can be used for so many things. Obviously, tourism and recreation kind of go hand in hand. And here in our county, we're looking at it as a, as a tourist attraction. Uh, I'm a tournament fisherman, a bass tournament fisherman, and so on these pools of, of the Kentucky River, we host several bass tournaments. We can have 15, 20, we've had as high as 25 boat tournaments uh, that will pay out $1,000 first place. So fishing is certainly a, a, probably the first thing that comes into my mind. Because of its solitude, sometimes you can be a lone ranger. Uh, you can have this whole pool of water all to your own. And that's even nicer. It's, it doesn't get much better than that. People need to come and enjoy what water can, can be fun at. Jet skiing, tubing, skiing. Uh, they've got it all. They don't have to go to Lake Cumberland to do that. They can do it here on the Kentucky River. So it's becoming more and more popular. And that's a good thing. All up and down the river are literally hundreds of, of buildings, of places, of historic nature. And that's what the Kentucky River Keepers is all about, is helping people know about that and, and maybe uh, using that in their life and, and enjoying that. They're the voice of the river. That's a great way of putting it. The beautiful thing about our river is that 
So much of it is undeveloped. What you're seeing is what 95% of this river looks like. You've got maybe five communities that touch the water, getting people out on the water, taking out more than you bring in, and being a good citizen on the river is just really important. You know, God put some things here on earth that man has to have in order to survive. Uh, water is certainly one of those. We have a resource of water here uh, that is a sustainer of life. Uh, it's a sustainer for man, mankind, uh, but it's also a sustainer for the nature. So for us here in Kentucky, and particularly the communities along the Kentucky River, uh, it, it's a necessity. It's something we must keep in the forefront of uh, making sure that we take care of and that we cherish it uh, because it is our sustainer. It's the water supply for many millions of people up and down the Kentucky River. It's a, it's a water supply for recreation, uh, but it's most importantly, it's a, it's a sustainer of life. So we've got to keep knowledge, we've got to keep the Kentucky River uh, as a valuable resource and understand its importance. Without it, of course, we would not have the, the beauty of the river that we do have here in the county. It's, it is used for pleasure more these days, but it is our drinking water, and it is very, very vital to our community. People see that it is an asset to the community, and they would like to see more recreation, more parks, and for it to be used, not just by the people in Estill County, but the people, any person that would like to come. When people say, oh, you're, 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 you want to save the fish or the snail darter or something like that, they don't realize that that means it's, that we're saving the river for them, for people. And when people are on the river and they're fishing, all of a sudden they care what's in the fish, what is in the water. We have almost a million people getting their drinking water from the Kentucky River and they turn their faucet on and they have water, so therefore there's no problem. And yet when you get them out on the river and into the tributaries and they go on these wonderful adventures, all of a sudden they do value the water itself and they see it as an incredible resource that they will not let go of again easily. We were told that the river was too compromised. We could never be a, 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 a scenic river or anything. As you can see, we have an incredible river. And those pollutants have decreased uh, exponentially. Uh, and so today, there's many times that the river is certainly very safe and people do get in, swim and, and recreate and have a good time on the river. And, and that's what it's all about. And I think that's the beauty of what the river keepers are about, are bringing attention to the Kentucky River and what it can mean. There are so many things that can happen to these wonderful ideas. And we took it on as a mission to connect some of these dots, connect some of these counties, connect some of these um, institutions and so we felt we have filled a niche once people are invested in this water they will they'll want to keep it they'll want to keep it healthy I think giving something back to the community and saying look what you have we want you to value this it is so important get your kids out on the river get your families on the river take it back it's yours Uh, it is really a great opportunity to enjoy the outdoors. Come have fun on the Kentucky River. I'm here with Susan Lancho from Kentucky American Water. Susan, in your estimation, what is the greatest urban threat to our natural resources like the Kentucky River and how does that affect you and I? 
I think the greatest threat for um, in urban settings for our natural resources is people not understanding the impact of their actions on the waterways. And so all of us collectively can work together to reduce the impact of various chemicals that are used, fertilizers, even medications that we um, may flush down the toilet eventually get into our creeks, our streams, and that's in our water. So all of us can play a role in protecting our source waters, our rivers, lakes, and streams, as well as our drinking water. I hope we've flooded your minds with stories of some of the state's nonprofit agencies who recognize that good communities require good water and that each of us has a responsibility to be good stewards of this precious resource. Any way you can help any of these organizations is a big help. Making a donation, volunteering your time, passing on a referral, or just mentioning the good work in your everyday conversations, every little bit counts. Support your watersheds. I'm Brian Simmons, signing off and asking you to no more.